Hello, welcome. Uh, I'm Shiloh Brooks, the Assistant Director of the Madison Program, lecturer in politics, um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you back to the third in the trilogy uh, of Teresa Bejan um, and these Charles uh, Test MD uh, 37 Distinguished Lectures. Um, I, she, her CV has not changed uh, since in, in the past 22 hours. I'm still going to introduce her, and I'm still going to say all the things. But I, I don't think you've published a book or an article in the past 22 hours. I, I wouldn't put it past you. Um, but our speaker is uh, Teresa Bijan. She's professor of political theory and a fellow at Oriel College at the University of Oxford. And her research uh, brings historical perspective to bear on questions in contemporary political theory. She's written extensively on free speech and civility, tolerance, equality in historical context. Uh, and those contexts range from Athens to the 20th century uh, in analytic political philosophy. In 2021, she was awarded the Philip Leverholm Prize in politics, which celebrates early career researchers who have achieved international recognition and have exceptional future promise. Her first book, Mere Civility, Disagreement and the Limits of Toleration, was published in 2017 and examined contemporary calls for civility in light of 17th century debates about religious toleration. Uh, it defended an ideal of mere civility consistent with American free speech fundamentalism deprived, uh, derived from Roger Williams, the founder of, the Rhode, uh, of uh, Rhode Island. Her current book manuscript is called First Among Equals, and it explores uh, the forgotten history of equality before modern egalitarianism. Her next major project is uh, a new edition of John Locke's Letters on Toleration. She's published articles in the American Political Science Review, uh, the American Journal of Political Science, Journal of Politics, British Journal of Political Science, Political Theory, uh, et cetera. She's got a special forum on the historical roles, which was published in 2021 in the journal Modern Intellectual History. Alongside her academic work, she writes for popular venues like the New York Times, The Atlantic, and The Washington Post. The third lecture in the series is entitled, if I'm not mistaken, Blind Spots. And uh, so join me in welcoming for the final time, Teresa Bejan. I should be able to do this by now. Brilliant. Well, thanks, Shiloh, for that introduction. And thank you all for coming out, um, for those who've been here every time and for those who've just come uh, for the first time today. Think of this as the return of the Jedi. Is that, is that right? OK. Yeah. Return the, or as I like to call it, um, not only blind spots, but also smoking guns. So um, for those of you who were here yesterday, um, in that lecture, I sought to tease out some of the varieties of leveling on offer in England in the late 1640s and early 1650s, and specifically to resist the lumping tendency of so much historical writing about groups like the Diggers, the Ranters, and the early Quakers in favor of some splitting. That discussion will, I hope, have confirmed to you something I mentioned in the first lecture on Monday, namely that the idea of equality, whether as a premise of political argument or indeed as a conclusion of political argument, is never just one thing. Equality refers to many different things, many different kinds of relationships. And I think that just the observation of the diversity, if you will, of equality both in the 17th century and in the 20th and 21st centuries can help us, I think, make a bit more sense um, of some of our contemporary controversies. Yesterday, I introduced you to a host of different early modern practices of leveling and argued that these were developed by activists in the service of, in the service of very different conceptions of equality. So um, on Monday, I talked about how, how the, the levelers themselves uh, understood equality as a relationship of parity or peerage. And then yesterday I talked about how so-called true levelers, like the digger Jared Winstonley, reimagined equal status as a relatively low or common condition, what he called commonality or commonality. And finally, George Fox and his fellow Quakers offered a particularly socially disruptive vision of equality as unity according to which the separateness of persons gave way to a kind of inward identity of the inner light. Nonetheless, I would suggest to you today that 
even in the midst of all of that diversity in all these 17th century visions of equality, there have been some common features. And I'd just like to take a minute to bring those out to make them explicit. Firstly, all of the activists and intellectuals I've discussed in this series thus far have shown a striking sensitivity to what we might call the horizontal or the interpersonal aspect of equality as a first person practical business of relating to other people as our equals. So in early modern England, relating to people as equals, or indeed relating to those unequals, had a lot to do with gestures, and more specifically with hats. That is, when men should wear them, when they should take them off, and to whom. So all of my early modern egalitarians were thus acutely aware to what a contemporary political philosopher like Elizabeth Anderson would call relational equality. Right? And indeed, I suggested in the first lecture that a similar sensitivity to the minutiae of comparative status um, has fueled a lot of our own contemporary con controversies for things, for instance, like about things like microaggressions or the politics of pronouns. And indeed, I argue that the Quakers basically got there first with respect to the politics of pronouns. So we should sort of have a look at what they were doing. Um, but in any case, all of these controversies, both 17th century ones and 21st century ones, I think should remind us um, uh, something about uh, the of something about the English word status. Okay, so the English word status derives from the Latin stare to stand, and so when we think about status and specifically equal status, it's never simply about our rights under the law. It's also physically even sort of it's a, it's a sense of this embodied sense of standing how we stand uh, in comparison with other people and in early modern England that is exactly a concretely physical sense of standing do we bow do we kneel do we stand bare or uh, or covered do we look someone in the eye or are our eyes downcast and all of these postures I'd submit to you are in evidence in that famous frontispiece, which I've shown to you every single lecture, but in which we're going to sort of zoom in on certain aspects of today, <laughs> of Hobbes's Leviathan. Because Hobbes knew well that human beings are fundamentally status conscious creatures, and this can really complicate their desire for equal respect and equal standing. So the concern with social practices brings me to the second feature that I think is common to all of the 17th century societies of equals I've been describing for you, namely that all of these putatively egalitarian projects, so of the levelers, the diggers, the Quakers, all of them have also uh, shown themselves to be persistently and we might even say profoundly hierarchical in certain aspects. So by this I mean that all of these putative society of equals have been characterized by one, inequalities of status and standing, according to which, two, certain people possess precedence and or authority over other people, right? So to take the most obvious example, and it's one that's illustrated in Hobbes' frontispiece, how exactly should a woman stand in a society of equals? Right, so in Hobbes' frontispiece, the women, you can see in the central um, detail, are wearing bonnets. But of course, for a woman in 17th century England, to have your head covered was a way of showing respect and indeed a sign of the woman's inferiority to men, right? So the politics of hat honor plays differently when we take in uh, the difference between the sexes. And so what are we to make, I think, here I really want to get to grips with the overt masculinism of so many of the leveler and indeed the diggers actions and theoretical claims. Is it possible that these early egalitarians simply saw no conflict between their claims that men and women were naturally equal on the one hand and the persistence of various forms of sexist subjection in their practices and theories on the other? And of course, patriarchy is not the only persistent form of hierarchy we've seen thus far in these societies of equals. As I mentioned yesterday, Jared Winstonley's utopia was not only a gerontocracy, but also a slave society. So I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in a moment. And even the Quakers, whose theology of the inner light explicitly denied the sex difference when it came to things like preaching, nevertheless endorsed a vision of hierarchy in its original sense that is as holy rule according to which both men and women are alike, as George Fox would put it, quote, restored by Christ up into the image of God. And that sense of proceeding up to God by degrees also conveys a sense that certain friends are further advanced and therefore weightier than other ones. 
Now here, you know, any political theorist in the, in the audience might object. Look, Teresa, okay, these visions may be hierarchical, Winston Lee and Fox's vision, sure, but surely they're less hierarchical than the society in which Winston Lee and Fox themselves lived, right? And so given that, Surely the most striking feature of the hierarchies that Winston Lee and Fox embraced is that they were in fact more inclusive than the hierarchies of the societies in which they lived, as well as better regulated, better justified, or otherwise constrained than, for instance, hereditary monarchy or primogenitor. Okay, certainly so, I, I absolutely agree. But what I'm interested in is how these you know, more egalitarian, if you will, forms of hierarchy illustrate a problem that I described to you in the first lecture. It was what I called the first among equals or the primus inter pares problem. So to borrow from George Orwell, how is it that even in a society of equals, certain people always end up being more equal than other ones? And if you're a feminist like me, you might ask the second question, why are those people so often women? And indeed, why are there so often slaves? hanging around. And so at the end of the first lecture, we encountered briefly what I consider to be the paradigmatic example of the primus inter pares problem in 17th century England. And that was in my discussion of the levelers. Now the poorest she may have been conspicuously absent at Put from Rainbow's demands at Putney, but it's not right to say that the leveler movement systematically excluded women, not at all. Women were central to the movement, both in protest and petitioning. And indeed, Lilburn's postscript makes a point of saying that both men and women are to be regarded as equal and alike by nature as peers or as equals. So likewise, when we turn to the celebrated petition of diverse, well-affected women delivered to Parliament in 1649, we see the petitioners insisting on their equality with men as equally created in the image of God. And yet when it comes to the freedoms of the Commonwealth, these leveler women claim only a, quote, proportionable share. They mention two specific freedoms in particular. The first is the right to trial by jury or 12 sworn men of the neighborhood. And the second is the right to petition parliament, a right that these women insist has been denied them when the House of Commons refused to receive their previous petition. But in both cases, the leveler women are not claiming that they should enjoy these liberties on the same or strictly equal terms with men. Rather, they're claiming a lesser share. Firstly, the right to a jury, but not to sit on one. And secondly, the right to petition parliament, but not to have a vote or voice. Now, one way of reconciling this apparent contradiction between the women petitioners claim to being equal with men on the other hand, on one hand, and entitled to a merely proportionable share on the other, is simply to remind ourselves that there were many different meanings of equality at the time and in play in early modern England, including as a political ideal of balance or proportion. So this came up in the Q&A yesterday, right? We may see, for instance, this, the petitioner's suggestion that they are physically weaker than men means that they should be treated differently with respect to political liberty. So what we have here, if we're readers of Aristotle, is simply an argument about poor proportionality as a principle of distributive justice, i.e. the relevant differences between men and women physically then should translate into a differential distribution of rights or freedoms in the Commonwealth. <laughs> but I would submit to you that is not how most scholars would read this today. Right? That's not how they would interpret this petition. Rather, they would read these leveler women as demanding inequality, for instance, by insisting on their own unequal status and political exclusion. And they would try to explain this apparent contradiction between the women's ostensibly egalitarian premises and their hierarchical conclusions by resorting to one of two strategies. I described these to you on Monday as either blind spots or smoking guns. So the first strategy suggests that male and female levelers alike were simply blind to their own sexist assumptions, hence unaware of the obvious contradiction in their own arguments. But we moderns are of course more enlightened, we're better placed to see the problem, and so we can appreciate the implicit egalitarianism of their arguments better than the levelers could themselves. And Elizabeth Anderson, God bless her, gives an amazing illustration of this in her recent book on the levelers. <clears throat> The second strategy rejects the blind spot approach as speciously exculpatory, as letting historical figures off the hook. 
Instead, it treats the sexist assumptions present in past arguments as smoking gun evidence of a more fundamental distortion, one that should render early modern ideals of, of ideas of equality intrinsically suspect as ideological cover, if you will, for more insidious forms of patriarchy. Now, it won't surprise you to learn that I don't find either strategy particularly helpful in making sense of the leveler women's petition, nor indeed of the various meanings of equality in the history of political thought. And so in the rest of the lecture, I wanna take a closer look at the two most notorious blind spots and or smoking guns in early modern political theory, namely the place of slaves and also the place of women in political arguments and see what they might tell us about the primus inter pares problem, the first among equals problem today. Now, both of these strategies, the blind spot strategy and the smoking gun strategy, will likely be most familiar to certainly the political theorists in the audience um, as applied to the works of canonical political philosophers, and more specifically, I mean one in particular, as applied to the work of John Locke. John Locke is the prime source of both blind spots and smoking guns that every sort of up and coming historian of political thought will cut her teeth on and point out. And indeed, over the past few decades, Carol Pateman and the late Charles Mills, among others, have used Locke's views on patriarchal marriage and slavery as smoking gun evidence of the constitutive sexism and racism of liberal social contract theory. But Locke has also been the beneficiary of a lot of blind spot strategies as well, for instance, in Jeremy Waldron's work on Locke's um, writings on human dignity and basic equality. But when it comes to Locke's scholarship, I think both strategies are remarkably fruitful. I've learned a lot from practitioners of both strategies, but I think they tell us very little about John Locke, this historical figure who was you know, born in the 1630s and died in 1704. What they really tell us more about is what the interpreter happens to think or feel about liberalism as an ideology and how then Locke as a kind of avatar or maybe a metonym for this thing called liberalism should then be kind of judged from the perspective of the present. I don't really go in for holding historical fi figures responsible for uh, present ills. I think we sort of can fall too easily into either the good, the good man or the bad man theory of intellectual history. Um, but I do think Locke can illustrate for us this, what, what I've called, what I've described to you as the primus inter pares problem in a really interesting way. Okay, so famously in the second treatise, Locke describes the state of nature as follows, quote, as a state of equality wherein all the power and jurisdiction are reciprocal, no one having more than any other, there being nothing more evident than that creatures of the same species and rank promiscuously born to all the same advantages of nature and the use of the same faculty should also be equal one amongst another without subordination or subjection. Okay, so Waldron in particular cites this as the foundation of Locke's egalitarian, quote, theory of politics, because the idea is that it's our equal status that acts as sort of um, prior to in normative over any hierarchical relations that we might subsequently adopt. So equal status precludes two types of hierarchical relations, Locke says, subordination, by which he means ordered degrees of priority or precedence, on the one hand, and then subjection, that is a kind of distinction of rank that implies a relation of authority as that which um, uh, inheres in relations between superior and inferior. But of course, later in the second treatise, <laughs> Locke also says the following, though I have said above that all men by nature are equal, I cannot be supposed to understand all sorts of equality, age or virtue may give men a just precedency, excellency of parts and merit may place others above the common level, birth may subject some, alliance or benefits, etc. He says, yet all this consists with the equality which all men are in with respect to jurisdiction or dominion one over another. Now, note that Locke's language here, for instance, of a just precedency would seem to imply precisely the sorts of relations of subordination and then explicitly then of subjection uh, that he originally ruled out. So there does appear to be a contradiction. And elsewhere in the two treatises, Locke will say directly that despite their status as natural equals, there is, I grant, a foundation in nature, not only for the subordination of wives to their husbands in marriage, but also for their subjection, because men are, quote, the abler and the stronger, 
And so here in Locke, I think we find a clear theoretical expression of the primus inter pares problem, as clear a one as we're going to find on offer in the 17th century. Namely, that Locke, like the levelers, for instance, seems to regard men and women's equal status as fully consistent with, and indeed mutually supportive of, the existence of hierarchical relations between them. And this should in turn make clear why neither the blind spot nor the smoking gun approach is gonna get us very far in understanding what's going on. Because both approaches are based on what is frankly a modernist or modernizing assumption that equality and hierarchy are antonyms, that they are opposite, right? But as we've seen over the course of these three lectures, the relationship between equality and hierarchy is a lot more complicated than that. So to get clearer on the specificity of the primus inter pares problem in Locke and elsewhere in the 17th century, um, as the kind of coincidence, let's say, of equality and hierarchy is being seen as consistent and mutually supportive, let's look at what is perhaps the most notorious 17th century blind spot or smoking gun today, namely slavery. I'm just gonna start by saying that I don't think slavery and may, I, perhaps people will agree, I, I don't think slavery is plausibly described as a blind spot in 17th century intellectual history, certainly not in Locke's work, because it, it, there's certainly a, pro, there's a problem of a, a kind of mismatch, certainly, between the kind of rhetoric of liberty in slavery that's just absolutely ubiquitous in the 17th century as practiced by people like John Lilburn and the realities, the brutal realities of chattel slavery as it existed as an institution. But slavery is something that people discuss often and very often find themselves in the position of having to offer a theory of. So it's not right to say it's a blind spot. And so if someone says it's a blind spot, I think that's, that's a fudge. So let's look actually what, what, what's said about slavery. Um, Locke's answer, of course, to the question of how a naturally free and equal person might nonetheless rightly come to occupy enslaved status was a fairly long-standing one. It's not an innovative one. It's that slaves can rightly be made out of prisoners of war. And it seems to me that Locke very much wanted to believe at that stage that people being shipped from West Africa to the British colonies were prisoners of war. And this belief, if mistaken, was pretty widespread but it's definitely the case that on the whole, 17th century English writers were far more concerned about the kidnapping of European Christians in the Mediterranean by North African pirates as the paradigmatically unjust form of slavery that they're trying to theory. They're offering a theory of why that's wrong not so much worried about offering theories about why other kinds of slavery are right, with, of course, one important exception. And I think that what I'm about to tell you does count as a blind spot in 17th century intellectual history, which is that the theory of just slavery as applying to prisoners of war doesn't fit very well. It doesn't apply to the slave trade, the global slave trade as it's developing, but it does seem to apply to the population who actually provided the dominant set of non-European forced labor in the British colonies of North America, namely Native Americans. So we seem to forget it because we, we're very focused on the, um, the West African slave trade, but the internal sort of colonial trade of American Indians captured in raids and also in armed conflicts, I think is really crucial for understanding what, how Locke is thinking in the 1670s and 80s. And it's something I fear that's just sort of been written out a bit of the history and it's really worth recovering. And of course, Mark Goldie is writing the definitive history now of Locke's uh, career on the Board of Trade. So he'll tell us all about it, what we should think. But in any case, just to give you a sense of the fact that, um, oh, sorry, I'm missing a slide. Um, to, so to say that the, the trade in Native Americans was a blind spot from the 21st, 20th and 21st centuries wasn't to say it was a blind spot from the 17th, because I introduced you last time to uh, the author of Tyrannopocrit Discovered, who styled himself Tom Telltruth. And Tom Telltruth has a very long discussion of the evils of slaving, enslaving the Native Americans in that 1649 pamphlet. And again, no one seems to talk about it, but it's a really fascinating discussion, which lamentably I failed to put on a, a slide for you. Okay, so slavery, not a blind spot, nor quite, I think, a smoking gun. Indeed, the point of slavery in 17th century arguments is to offer a paradigmatic example of unequal status as well as unfree status. So in slavery, the 
absence of freedom and the absence of equality are connected. Um, if that's right, then in 17th century England, at least, slavery is not an example of the primus inter pares problem either, which only arises, as I say, when hierarchical relations are imagined as being consistent with one's status as an equal. And so, well, um, we do begin to get quite moving and unsparing condemnations of the abuses of enslaved people by their masters in Barbados and elsewhere in the Caribbean in the 17th century that does begin to come in. I would say that intellectually, the criticism in the 1640s and 50s is focused not on how the equality of enslaved people should preclude their enslavement. It's rather how the equality of human beings um, is inconsistent with the slave trade that is paying money for enslaved persons, right? And so, so Samuel Rutherford, for instance, gives a good example of this kind of distinction. He's going to distinguish between slavery uh, as a penal condition with scriptural warrant from the trade in slaves, the buying and selling of people, which he says is an abomination because man is, as a coin bearing God's image, race sacra, a sacred thing. So I think, I don't know, as a Presbyterian, I think he's sort of also getting a dig in at Catholics and the trade in relics in this passage, but I, I can't be sure. Um, <clears throat> so given, um, so Rutherford, I think, can help us understand that um, the, this argument about how equality might mean that it's problematic to pay money for other people. And I think that distinction can then help us make sense of something I've alluded to uh, 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 both yesterday and today, which is the odd place of slavery in Jared Winstonley's Society of Equals. So his digger utopia described in The Law of Freedom in a Platform in 1652. So given his reputation as an egalitarian of all the lettre, I think it's fair to say that the centrality of slavery in Winstonley's model commonwealth is for many readers unexpected. But it's the case that a good portion of the short and pithy laws he puts forward in the law of freedom have to do with regulating the institution of slavery. So you'll see from this slide, Winston Lee has in mind here slavery as a form of penal servitude designed for men and women who refuse to live according to what he calls the law of righteousness by refusing to work, say, or by invading others' properties or by trying to hire themselves out as laborers. And these slaves are to be distinguished from the rest of the population by their clothing, they wear white, and are to be under the supervision of a specially elected officer called biblically enough the taskmaster, who will assign them to work for particular freemen or particular family, families. And so the slaves are going to work alongside the servants in the Commonwealth, who are generally uh, the free youth. And for Winston Lee, everyone under the age of 40 counts as a youth. He's 43 when he writes this. I think it's relevant. And in any case, but the slaves, unlike the servants, will be whipped if they disobey. They'll be fed a coarse diet, and in extremis, they can be killed as traitors to the Commonwealth. So this discussion has been almost completely ignored by scholars of the diggers. Um, but I want to sort of just emphasize how slavery emerges in Winston Lee's Society of Equals as an essentially equalizing institution, one that acts as an instrument of leveling down and humbling the children of pride. So the unequal status of the slave becomes, on Winston Lee's view, a fundamentally corrective or educative condition intended to restore recalcitrant members of the Commonwealth who think either too highly of themselves or indeed too lowly of themselves by hiring themselves out as laborers to this state of seeing themselves, looking upon themselves, he says, as an equal in creation. And Winston Lee will also insist, like Rutherford, that slavery is fundamentally a penal condition, and therefore there cannot be any trade in slaves. And there, that's a difference with Thomas More's Utopia, for those who are maybe interested in kind of the similarities there. So More thinks you can buy and sell enslaved people. Winston Lee insists that you can't. But of course, that, that's just in line with his blanket, blanket ban on the cheating art of buying and selling in the Commonwealth, right? So it's of the essence of a Commonwealth, he says, quote, that it's the regime that governs the earth without buying and selling and thereby makes both the elder brother and the younger brother free men in the earth. <clears throat> okay. But of course, that quotation, the elder brother and the younger brother is free men in the earth, that is an appeal to an ideal of fraternity right? 
And as Carol Pateman has taught us, when we get fraternity lang language, it sort of behooves us to pay attention to the place of women in all of this. And of course, the place of women in the society of the law of freedom and the platform is one of political silence and exclusion. Okay. So on the one hand, Winston Lee insists that women are perfectly equal with men, but on the other hand, they are completely excluded from political equality in the Commonwealth and the um, law of freedom. And so I think this brings us back to the Leveler women's petition. As I observed earlier, the idea of equality as balance is clearly in play here in the appeal to proportion. But I would argue also that the key conception of equality at work here remains the leveler conception of equality as parity or peerage, and that these leveler women, like their male counterparts, are insisting that their status as natural peers or equals entitles them to be treated as such by the society in which they live. But clearly we can see from the petition that leveler men and women alike agreed that the subordinate place assigned to women in both the household and the commonwealth was in fact consistent with their status as peers or equals, that is, as pares. And this reminds us of the disconnect. Um, so, for, so for a modern egalitarian, that remains a disconnect, it remains a contradiction. How can one be unequal on the one hand and yet entitled to a lesser share of political rights? And so to see how this works, I think it's just helpful now to consider the origins of a phrase I've been using these past three, day, three days and indeed from which I take my title, which is of course the Latin phrase primus inter pares. <laughs> so what does that phrase mean? Where does it come from? Well, as some of you probably know, it comes from the Roman Republic and it's the title of seniority offered to the senior member of the Senate, which gives him the privilege of speaking first in debate. Okay, and although the Latin word pares is routinely translated today as equals in English, that itself is, I think, an artifact of the kind of deliberate conflation and exploitation of an ambiguity that the levelers were up to in the 1640s, which I showed you on Monday with respect to Cook's commentary on Magna Carta. Okay, so we've lost this distinction between equality and parity, but it's an important distinction for the Romans, certainly. Because equality uh, was a relationship that was uh, fundamentally a quantitative one that permitted of measurement, whereas parity was a rougher business of uh, a kind of essentially evaluative comparison by which different or even incommensurable things might neither, nonetheless be judged to be alike enough to be treated on a par or as matching. So pair and par are, are the same word. And in politics, this meant most fundamentally that pares, so the senators, were entitled to political voice, as well as dignified treatment under the civil law. And so also in the Roman Republic, you have a sense of Roman citizens, so adult male citizens living in the city of Rome, but not outside the city of Rome, as being aequos et pares, so equals and peers. Given this, I think the phrase primus inter pares indicates that although all of the senators regarded themselves as pares, all enjoying the right to speak on the question at hand, there nonetheless existed a pronounced pecking order between them, according to which the most senior member would speak first and so set the terms of a debate. But the precedence he enjoyed remained consistent with the parity of all of the senators. But of course, when the Republic is overthrown, the title primus inter pares is one of many that's assumed by the Roman emperor. And under the empire, the notion that the prince or princeps is simply primus among his senatorial pares is strained past all plausibility, right? So the phrase primus inter pares, it has, it has a kind of irony or even poignancy. And I think that is really the essence of the primus inter pares problem. It's the problem that emerges when acceptable differentiation or relationship of precedency or priority then transform into uh, unacceptable forms of subjection. And so relations of inferiority and superiority. And so th that's how I propose we understand the leveler women's petition. They're not calling for their own silence from the Commonwealth, not at all. They're using their voices and they're speaking loudly. They're demanding the right to petition, but they're effectively demanding the right to be secundus inter pares. <laughs> Right, allowing men to retain priority, okay? So we might think about this as a call for inclusion on the basis of subordination, 
right? But not subjection. So I think the leveler women would want to say we can be subordinate, but we're not subjected as women. We might be, but we're subjected to our husbands. We're not subjective to the Commonwealth in that way. Okay, they're demanding the right to have a say and to have a public presence in public affairs. So the argument I've just outlined to you, I should probably say this now, it's sexist. This is a sexist argument, right? And when I sort of try to understand an argument, it doesn't mean that I'm endorsing it. But I certainly think that we should think carefully about this argument because it's not just the sort of, um, uh, it's sort of, um, you know, apology. It's not the smoking gun or apology for patriarchal domination and exclusion that I think many of us might expect to find. Um, what we have here is a plea, again, for inclusion, but it's also a defense of a pecking order, one that's consistent with women's status as peers or equals with men. Okay, <clears throat> so all of the distinctions I've been making between, for instance, subordination and subjection, inclusion and exclusion, um, I think that they're really important if we want to understand the logic of leveling in 17th century England, especially that as practiced by the leveler, so Lilburn and his colleagues, um, on the basis of equality as parity, how that actually worked. Because according to the levelers, and sort of preeminently Lilburn, human being status as natural pares or peers evidently entitled commoners, both men and women, to be treated on a par with their aristocratic counterparts. But in a society where earls still outranked barons, and even the noblest woman lacked political rights, and indeed only the eldest sons of landed uh, peers could inherit their title, or indeed a seat in the House of Lords, right? Parity of treatment ends up preserving in rank inequalities of status or standing, right? So I think with Locke, we might think, think of these as differences of degree rather than distinctions of rank. Okay, and so the business of leveling up then, arguably, becomes a kind of project, and you see this clearly in Overton, of male commoners demanding to be treated like lords, and also demanding that their wives be treated like ladies, and that their servants be treated like servants, but upper, upper servants, upper servants, right? So again, it's sort of lifting, lifting everyone up, but preserving this kind of differentiation within the rank. Okay, and that explains, of course, why leveling up is not sort of so straightforward as Jeremy Waldron sometimes presents it being. It also explains that, you know, when I characterize the levelers as paritarians as opposed to egalitarians, the kind of difference um, in political project I mean. Okay, but it also helps explain why the levelers don't see pecking orders as such as problematic or objectionable. Because so long as everyone who's a pares, women as well as men, can still have a voice right, through petitioning or anything else, okay? So that brings us back to Locke and his great critic, the so-called first English feminist, a woman named Mary Astall. <clears throat> to return to Locke in the second treatise, I would argue that Locke's theory of equality in the second treatise is a theorization of the sort of practice of equality as parity that I've identified in the levelers. You know, and more of an argument is needed there, I don't have time to make it. But I, I would say that he's trying to theorize a kind of practice. And to be an equal for Locke is to occupy a rank according to which all members enjoy a freedom from subjection. But this status is nonetheless compatible with many different forms of subordination according to which some people appear to be more equal than others, right? <clears throat> but just as the fate of Roman senators reminds us, mere differences have a habit of hardening over time into new and hierarchically ordered distinctions. Just as subordinate status can easily slip into relations of subjection or uh, subjection and inferiority. And it's this slippage, I think, that Mary Astle is diagnosing in John Locke's political thought. And she diagnosed it sort of more accurately and more acidly, I think, than anyone before or since. So today, Astle is probably best known to political theorists um, through Carol Pateman's classic from 1988, The Sexual Contract. So if you read The Sexual Contract, Pateman quotes Astle repeatedly in that work. And she quotes the passage I have for you on the slide, right? The most famous line. If all men are born free, how is it that all women are born slaves? As they must be, if the being subjected to the inconstant, uncertain, unknown, arbitrary will of men be the perfect condition of slavery. 
So this line comes from the 1706 preface to the third edition of Astle's pamphlet, Reflections on Marriage, which was published shortly after Locke's death, sort of two years after Locke's death. Um, he died in 1704. And the italics here reflect direct quotations from Locke's second treatise. And in the preface, Astle is indeed ruthlessly calling out the hypocrisy, as she sees it, of Whigs like Locke and Republicans like Milton, who see arbitrary power in the state as an intolerable tyranny, but nonetheless seem perfectly happy to overlook or even endorse the arbitrary of power of husbands over their wives. But surely Astle observes, quote, 100,000 tyrants are worse than one. Such, ob such observations make Astel the darling, or made Astel the darling of academic feminists in the 80s and 90s. And they really regarded her as the um, sort of found, sort of the first canonical thinker in a sort of anti-liberal feminist canon. Um, so she becomes a kind of poster child for radical feminism in the 90s. But this characterization of Astel was and is, as the kids say, problematic for a number of reasons. Firstly, because uh, far from being a radical who saw Locke and Milton as not having gone far enough, right? Astle is in fact an arch conservative. She's a Tory who saw claims to resistance, whether in the church or the state, as ludicrously disloyal. Indeed, Astle thought state of nature theorizing just altogether was um, uh, just a simple obfuscation of the fact that human beings were not born free Rather, they were born as subjects to whatever political authority happened to obtain where they lived. And for English men and women at the beginning of the 18th century, Asta loved to point out that they were born naturally subject to a woman, namely Queen Anne. Um, she has this terrific line. Most admirable doctrines are equally true and loyal, and is not Her Majesty infinitely obliged to you, sir, for spreading it all? Hobbes' idea of natural equality. Okay, secondly, this identification of uh, Astle as a kind of anti-liberal feminist, I mean, anti-liberal is fine, but as a kind of uh, more radical kind of feminist, um, ignores the fact that the sort of reductio that Astle offered in response to Locke in 1706 was absolutely standard in Tory political pamphlets starting from the 1640s, right? So Filmer, none other than Robert Filmer in 1648, had savaged the lack of fit between contract theory and political practice by saying, quote, where there is an equality of nature, there can be no superior power. That's the Bellarmine argument, right? And women, especially virgins, who by birth have as much natural freedom as any other, therefore ought not to lose their liberty, but without their own consent. That's Filmer in 1648. But finally, the, the, the third problem with reading Astle in this way um, is that in the 1706 preface, Astle is not actually that concerned about Locke's second treatise. That's not the work that she's focusing on. Rather, she's fixated on one of Locke's much more obscure and posthumously published works, his paraphrase and notes on the epistles of St. Paul, which you've all read. Standardly, yeah, we should all read it. In that work, Locke offers a commentary on Paul's statement um, at 1 Corinthians 11, that women should not preach or prophesy with their heads uncovered. Locke tries to make sense of this passage as follows. This about women seeming as difficult a passage as there is <laughs> in Paul's epistles, seems to say the silence enjoined is a mark of their subjection to the male sex. The women in the churches were not so much as to ask questions, for this shows a kind of equality, which was also forbidden. But yet this subordination of the sex, which God for God's for order's sake hath instituted, hindered not, but that by supernatural gifts of the spirit, he might make use of the weaker sex to an extraordinary function whenever he thought fit, as well as he did with men. Now, interestingly, the argument that Locke is making here in defense of women preaching in defense of women speaking in church is precisely the argument made by the early Quakers. Specifically, it's the argument that Margaret Fell makes in her 166 pamphlet, Women Speaking Justified. I think I mentioned it yesterday. So the idea that Christ sort of manifested himself to women and men alike without respect of persons. So any woman who has inspiration, sort of, is, you know, if he sort of pours his spirit forth upon a woman, she should be allowed to speak. 
And one might expect an argument like this to appeal to a feminist like Astel. But instead, the whole discussion in Locke drives her absolutely ballistic, right? Because she identifies it, this essential slippage, this sort of primus inter paris slippage, specifically the slippage between the subordination and subjection of particular wives to their particular husbands to the natural subordination and subjection of women on the whole to men on the whole. Astle begins her own discussion of Corinthians in the preface, 1706 preface, by attempting to undo the politics of gesture, according to which a woman's keeping her head covered is meant to be a sign of her inferiority. She argues that all of this head covering business, just like the bit about men having long hair in Corinthians, is just about the fashions customary in the Hellenic world. She says, quote, no inequality can be inferred from hence, that is from head covering nor indeed from the gradation that the apostle there uses, that the head of every man is Christ, and that the head of the woman is man, and that the head of Christ is God. Whatever the apostle's argument proves in this place, there is much more to be said against the present fashion of men's wearing their hair long than there is for the supremacy men as men lay claim to. Good, I, you're laughing, it's funny, right? All those guys running around with their long hair. Okay, so here Astle is really keen to insist that all of the business of headship in Corinthians is describing a form of subordination imposed by the early Christians for the sake of decency and order, but not as a reflection of women's natural inferiority. And so she attacks Locke, the ingenious paraphrast, as she calls him, for making precisely this mistake. Quote, besides the conclusion the apostle draws from this argument concerning women is so very obscure a text that the ingenious paraphrase who pleads so much for the natural subjection of women ingenuously confesses that he does not understand it. The relation between the two sexes is rather mutual and the dependence reciprocal, both of them depending entirely upon God and upon him only, which one would think is no great argument of the natural inferiority of either sex. So the important distinctions that Astle's making here, which have been sort of sadly overlooked, I think um, are, you know, <laughs> speak directly to the sort of issues we've been wrestling with over the past three days together about equality and hierarchy and how they can or cannot go together. Astle's consistent and clear throughout her writings that she does not object at all to the subordination or the subjection of women in marriage. She thinks that there is a scriptural foundation for patriarchal marriage, that women who marry owe their wives, their husbands an absolute obedience, just as they owe an absolute obedience to Queen Anne, their sovereign. Okay, what she objects to rather is the inference made from that subordination and subjection of individual wives to their individual husbands to any sort of natural subjection of one sex to the other one. Tis true through want of learning and of that superior genius which men as men lay claim to, I was ignorant of the natural inferiority of our sex, which our masters laid down as self-evident and fundamental truth. For if by the natural superiority of their sex they mean that every man is by nature superior to every woman, then Queen Anne ought to command, not to command, but to obey her footmen. That the custom of the world has put women, generally speaking, into a state of subjection is not denied, but the right can no more be proved from the fact than the predominancy of vice can justify it. And then she goes on to what I think is the first example of the feminist men are pigs joke in the history of political thought. She, com she compares agreeing to marry a man to contracting oneself to keep hogs. She's not made for that, but she ought to perform it conscientiously. Right. Notice here, though, that Astle is basically agreeing with what Locke says about marriage in the second treatise, okay? That whatever hierarchical relations exist within a marriage become binding for a particular woman only if and when she has consented to them. Before that, though, she is just as free and just as equal as her husband is or was. And that, I think, brings us to the essence of Astle's feminism. She's not objecting, again, to patriarchal marriage, but she thinks that marriage is distinguished from other hierarchical institutions to which she's committed through this idea of consent, that women have to enter it freely and as equals. They must have a voice to put themselves under to use Rainborough's language at Putney, 
In Locke's language, they must consent. But how free can consent really be if there are simply no other alternative options for women in English society? And more specifically, if women on the whole have been denied the education that they need in order to be able to rationally evaluate the proposals that are being made to them by men. And so a big theme of reflections on marriage is simply the prevalence of what Astle describes as unequal marriages, the horror of an unequal marriage, particularly in which a woman excels over her husband intellectually and ethically. And all of the women who have fallen basically as prey to fortune seekers, right? She thinks that society has just abandoned these women as prey to predatory men. Something has gone very deeply wrong in Astle's view in a society where marriage is seen as the be all and end all for half of humankind. One in which women are raised to think, think of that the marriage is the purpose for which they're made. And so therefore to think of themselves as being made to be servants to whatever unsuitable uh, chancer happens to come along. And this she thinks then this sort of perverse institutional arrangement leads, encourages men to think of themselves and their sex as naturally superior, no matter how deficient they actually are. And so that brings us to the sort of the, the thrust of Astle's writing, her focus on education. So in 1694, she made her own serious proposal to the ladies. She wanted to offer women an alternative to marriage um, and so that they're not compelled to accept unequal matches. So the idea is to found an independent women's academy where well-to-do uh, women who are unmarried sort of put their dowries into an endowment, right? So this is sort of this early idea of a women's college. Now, Astle, uh, unfortunately, at one point describes it as a monastery, which is not the most strategic thing that she could have done in a Protestant country in the 1690s. But in any case, she is pointing to what she sees as the peculiar predicament of women, unmarried women in Protestant societies, basically where the convents have been closed. There's no alternative, there's no place. Women who are unmarried basically become superfluous. They are a problem for their relations. And so, you know, it's wrong to call Astle the first, the first English feminist, but I do think she's an innovative English feminist because she's not simply interested to argue, as many women had before her, that the best of women were equal to or even superior to the best of men. She's not going to give you a catalog of great ladies or mention the Amazons, right? Which is what had been going on for centuries and centuries. She, she's simply committed to the idea that the sexes are equal. Despite the diversity of individuals within them, there are no natural relations of subordination or sex, uh, su subjection between the sexes. Okay. So, so much for blind spots, so much for smoking guns, so much for this lecture series and the pursuit of equality before egalitarianism and 17th century political thought. What can all of this maybe tell us about equality and hierarchy in the primus inter pares problem today? Okay. Well, what Astle saw and others miss, I think, is that reimagining human equality as a parity claim, as a kind of claim to equal respect, of standing as an equal, can, seed, can succeed politically only insofar as that claim is plausible within the society as it concurrently exists. So self-styled pares or peers must appear to be alike enough to the comparatively privileged members of their own society in order for the argument to work, in order for the leveling logic to kick in. And that's why successful egalitarian movements generally begin by emphasizing the shared experiences that unite people of different backgrounds as alike enough, as matching, in order to be treated on a par. For levelers like Lilburn, the parody of freeborn Englishmen and women was grounded in their mutual sacrifice during the English Civil War. But ultimately, the levelers built their most successful arguments on the back of shared experiences of service within institutions, namely the army and the jury, from which women were formerly, formally excluded. So the plausibility of the parity claim with respect to women just isn't there. It ends up then perversely encouraging this sort of way of regarding women as, well, we should be peers, but in fact, we all know they're really inferior. And so the sort of the hierarchically ordered distinctions plaguing societies of equals from Athens to early modern England, I think Astle would argue are sort of products of this evaluative and sort of contrastive comparison to which parity, parity claims are prone. Because we often assess whether or not two people are peers 
sort of the shorthand we sort of say, well, are they sort of alike in being better than that other person, than that other group of people? So again, it's that comparative contrastive assessment of parity as a kind of shared value or virtue. And so that's why Assel is so emphatic that we need educational institutions for women so that they aren't always the losers in these comparisons, right? That ends up affirming this idea of their inferiority, their fitness for subjection. Okay. So taking a step back now, um, in the book on which I base these lectures, I conclude with a normative argument addressed to political theorists and philosophers. The argument is focused on recovering the distinctiveness of parity, both its promise and its perils, as a political ideal today. One that I think speaks directly to the concerns of modern relational egalitarianism, to which I've sort of alluded several times in these lectures, but also to many modern progressive social movements. But more generally, my hope is that by recovering and restoring some complexity to the history of equality before egalitarianism, I can help people across disciplines, both inside and outside the academy, uh, this came up yesterday, to appreciate the peculiar power of equality as a political ideal. And I think that appreciation is sort of more needed now than ever, because we're in this moment where there's a growing suspicion on both the left and the right that equality talk is, you know, at best cheap or at worst sort of problematic that equality encourages us to uh, adopt a kind of blindness that refuses to see relevant differences. Among young progressives especially, there's a growing sense that we should reject equality in favor of equity as an all-purpose political ideal. But I would simply remind them that equality, like liberty, is an ancient and honorable ideal, one that carries its history with it. And so before we turn our backs on equality, it would probably behoove us to pay attention to its history and to attend to its different meanings. For instance, the principle of balance, of indifference, of proportion, of unity, of commonality, of parity. And if we do pay attention, we might discover that these historical conceptions not only continue to shape how we think about and do equality when we're trying to relate as equals, but also even capture some of our normative demands better than other languages we might appeal to. But in any case, I hope to have persuaded you that political theorists and historians alike have more to gain from consulting the past than unexpected recruits to our side in a present argument. And I hope that the lost distinctions and forgotten visions of equality I've presented here can do a little to help restore some shared meanings, even as we continue to disagree about the things that matter most. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let's begin the, the question period. Who'd like to who'd like to start? Professor Burns. Thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. I wonder if you could take us back to the second of the quotations that you had from Locke's second treatise. Um, now. If I understood you correctly, you were saying that this contradicts the first. It would appear to. So in what way, if you could just repeat the argument? So just the explicit statement that um, to be equal one amongst another without subordination or subjection, and then the specific allowance of subordination and subjection. And then he specifies, he means without subordination or subjection with respect to this sort of stat juridical status of freedom. Right, but then he also says, and yet, and yet, this consists with the equality, the, the half of the quotation that you didn't seem to address. It consists with the equality. Absolutely, that's why I think it's an example of the primus inter pares problem. Okay, I'm not sure that it is, though. Is okay, I'm, tell me. Uh, for this reason, the inequality between men and women as he presents it is a mere matter of strength. And he denies that it is a matter of natural right. In fact, he insists that by natural right, men and women are equal. And um, either natural right or their contract will allow a woman to divorce her husband absolutely um, and to uh, acquire material goods and this it seems to me to be 
fully consistent with the argument made in the first treatise, which comes out in the account of the fall, where Locke argues that, yes, um, God commanded men be subordinate to women, um, but it was only a prediction. It, it wasn't a curse. Um, just like giving birth in, uh, in pain. It was just a prediction. And if a remedy can be found for it against nature, then that remedy should be sought. Um, and I'm wondering, so why, why don't you see that here, especially because he's saying natural right establishes equality, mm -hmm. even if strength is against it? So, I, yeah, I, I don't disagree with that at all. So I probably wasn't clear enough. I mean, I think for many feminist critics of Locke, they're not so much fixated on the claim that men are stronger. It's this idea that men are abler. And so there's this question then, okay, what do we mean by abler? Is that a kind of allusion to uh, excellency of parts and merit, right? That there's a kind of superior virtue in men. But my argument is actually that from Astle's perspective, the second treatise, the first and second treatises are fine. I don't think she disagrees with them, except for the characterization of it. I think she would think Locke doesn't characterize marriage as hierarchical enough, as patriarchal enough. No, that's very, that's especially helpful for arguing about that. Um, one of the Locke's arguments doesn't seem to be that women are inferior to men. Hers does on equality before God. It relies on this natural equality. Um, or uh, natural right, which in the first treatise especially, he seems to derive without any reference to God. And on that vexed question, I will simply defer to Jeremy Waldron and Michael Zephyr. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Let them uh, hash that out. Others? Yes, please. You talk about the difference between characters for followers and then also the equity. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe just characterize that? All right. Um, you, uh, the, the difference is how you see those between those three again, um, relative to maybe both historical as well as current uh, usage. Yeah, so, um, so this kind of ancient Roman distinction or this distinction in, in classical Latin and then post-classical Latin between equalitas and peritas. I mean, equalitas, as I've said, I mean, it can mean a lot of different things, but I think there's this shared sense of equality relations as permitting of a kind of precision that can be measured. So there's a kind of, kind of objective quality to equality relations, whereas parity is this kind of rough and ready kind of comparison. Do these things match enough? And, you know, it's not definitive, but I think the idea is that parity sort of is a concept that derives from trade, right? This idea of these, are these things subject to exchange? And then of course the language of parity is preserved then in financial markets and kind of the, you know, the, par, the par of exchange. I mean, that's, a, that's another sort of area of debate in 17th century England that's really interesting, but um, which I sort of avoid as much as I can. Um, equity though, on the other hand, is really interesting because, and again, in the sort of, in Latin, the sort of hard distinction between equalitas and equitas is not there so much. I mean, sort of the sense that equitable is another way of saying just, and equal is another way of saying just. And all of these concepts derive from that metaphor I described, or that image I described on the first day of the balanced scale. So the equity is the evenness of the balance scale. Equality is the suspension of the balance scale. Um, so there's a kind of um, amb ambiguity, uh, or just even just a sort of porousness between you know, equality and equity from the beginning. But then equity language gets a sort of distinctive technical meaning in the law, and specifically, if, you know, fasting forward, fast forwarding a lot to the common law, you have equity courts as being specifically where judgments are made beyond the law, sort of making exceptional uh, accommodations for the differential placement of individuals. And so equity becomes a kind of fairness beyond the law, and it really relies on the, um, I mean, John Selden, as ever, has a really great quote that I might be able to 
uh, remember it all, but basically equity, the standard of equity then lies in the virtue or expertise of the particular judge who's making the decision. So equity sort of presumes the existence of an authority of virtuous judges who can then decide. And so, you know, for fast forwarding to kind of, you know, where does this all leave us today? I mean, it, I, I'm just profoundly skeptical of equity language precisely because I think it very often is appealing implicitly to this idea of kind of epistemic authority, that there is a sort of well-positioned person who can say definitively what the equitable arrangement is. Whereas equality, this gets into the normative argument, again, that sort of permits of a kind of um, objective assessment and debate of measurement, these kinds of things. Again, I think that's great for the things you can actually measure. There are all these other sorts of issues we care about which aren't permitting of measurement, measurement. And that's where I say, well, parity actually can capture the relationship we want. Um, so I'm a pluralist with respect to all of these concepts. I think they're all important. I think political theorists should really just recover some of these distinctions, and they can help us sort of think and speak more clearly. But that would sort of go then with this caveat that I think equity, very often the appeal of it is it's just it's a homophony with equality. It sounds like equality, but doesn't have the kind of problems that we've identified with equality. I wonder if you might address um, a peculiarly, at least according to Tocqueville, American problem. I, I thought about Tocqueville a great deal throughout your presentations, largely because um, Tocqueville is among the greatest psychologists of equality that I'm aware of. And um, he has this line in Democracy in America where he says, in a nation which is free, every inequality uh, strikes the eye all the more violently. In other words, um, there's an addiction to equality when men are free, such that even if they're mostly equal, the tiniest inequality they'll find offensive and that they would rather be um, equal in chains than free and unequal. And this portends some tragedy for the future of democracy that one must uh, work by way of associations and encouraging self-government and maybe the tutoring of Christianity uh, for, uh, of our longing for equality to somehow um, make it such that this doesn't bring us down. Um, and so I'm wondering, to go back to what you say at the end of your talk today, how this notion of parity could solve the problem or at least contribute to a, a kind of tutoring of our longing for equality that Tocqueville fears and that equity seems to be a symptom of or a response to. It is itself what Tocqueville predicted would happen. Um, and so I wonder how your, your argument speaks to this difficulty and can provide a solution to it. I mean, well, solution. I'm not really in the or some, of solutions. I, I, it could I, shape a, it. <laughs> as a political theorist, I sort of see my role as uh, helping to diagnose problems that can only be managed, never solved. Fair. Okay. <laughs> so management <laughs> strategies. Right. right. Um, but no, thanks. It's really a, a, an excellent question and speaks directly, I think, to kind of my normative concerns. I'm going to just say um, Tocqueville is a great psychologist, but I mean, the best, I mean, the best, I mean, the best is this guy. I mean, just this, <laughs> I think the sort of worry, right, and also the awareness of um, the uh, instability of societies and equals, precisely because equals will, will be look, on the lookout for affronts to their equal status or standing. Yeah. So you know, I don't want to overread the front of the piece, but let me overread <laughs> the front of the piece for a minute. I mean, I think one of the really interesting things here is that. Um, Abraham Boss also just gets this sense of, you know, Hobbes doesn't want the individual sort of, the, these individuals to be looking at each other. He wants them always to be focused on the sovereign and their relationship to one another as mediated through their relationship to the sovereign. So, I mean, if you look here in this corner, we'll sort of neglect this, but you have sort of several uh, bareheaded men who are kneeling. And they're meant to be sort of ministers of sovereignty. But it's precisely the point, if, you, if the hatted people start looking at the bareheaded people, and the bareheaded people start looking at the hatted people, well, then that's gonna be, that's gonna be a problem, right? <laughs> yeah. So the educative uh, dimension is really important. Um, I mean, to say something controversial, I mean, I think Winstonly actually is sort of <laughs> sensitive to this as well. I mean, you know, it's not to endorse the sort of Winstanley and slavery, but the sense that you're going to have to have institutions that basically educate people to content themselves with equality. Um, 
I mean, as a political theorist and kind of a normative argument, my solution, as far as it goes, is a Tocquevillian one. Mm. I think Assel is right that basically, in order for parody claims to be plausible, you need institutions within which people reliably encounter one another, not you know, as as pares, as peers. Um, and in a large and complex society, there's going to have to be associational diversity mm -hmm. with respect to those institutions. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, to use the example of the women's college, I mean, I think Astle would argue you need sex segregated spaces, basically, so that women can relate to other women as peers, and then they can go out and sort of prove their mettle against the men, right? Mm -hmm. I guess this is an increasingly controversial example, but I think that argument is an interesting one. And I think Hannah Arendt also has that sense of the idea that the, the theoretical claims, the grand ideas are, you know, in order to preserve and protect them, we really need to attend to practice and institutional uh, questions and just the everyday realities of how people are interacting with one another. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, please. Sorry. Yeah. For the recording. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask a sort of selfish political theorist question. Um, so if democracy is the kind of ideal mode of governance or uh, instantiation of equality, whether it be um, equal chance of um, gaining access to leadership, um, maybe some kind of autocratic view, uh, or you know, one person, one vote, um, where does parity get us? Um, if equality invites democracy, what does parity invite? Is it democracy? Um, is it something like uh, English pluralism? Or does it sort of collapse into the familiar Andersonian or Deweyan conception of um, deliberation amongst equals? Well, I'll just, I'm going to deny the premise. So I think yeah. that um, part of what I'm doing in this project is breaking the link between equality and democracy. I think that is a contingent connection <laughs> rather than a necessary one. Um, certainly Athenian democracy, which I talk about a lot in the book, is, as we know, connected with a kind of sense of the uh, adult male citizens as isotes. But it's actually, as in Rome, it's actually the ideal of adult male citizens as isotes a, a um, Right, so it's the, they're equal and similar. And then that leads Aristotle to this idea of the metrioi as kind of the middling man. So I would say that democracy or political equality is predicated on a kind of parity claim uh, historically. That's the connection. So if you're a Democrat, then you should care a lot about parity. Um, I mean, speaking to the Andersonian point, I mean, so maybe I should sort of clarify a bit my relationship to her her um, theories of relational egalitarianism. Um, I very much like the sort of her attention to the connection between kind of social status and standing and political status and standing. I think that's absolutely right, and economic status and standing. I mean, one of the things that attracts me to early modern uh, arguments is precisely because these things all go together. They're not sort of disconnected in the way that we kind of modernists tend to, tend to think of. Um, I'm not really persuaded by her relational egalitarianism as a political theory, because I actually think if, if you know, relational equality as a social ideal could be satisfied <laughs> in a constitutional monarchy, right? I mean, I don't think it necessarily entails democracy in the way that she thinks it does. The connection comes in then when you tie parity to ideas of voice, and I think that's probably the argument that she want to make. But um, but yeah, as ever, I'm trying to kind of complicate the connections and sort of um, maybe break the circuit slightly. Maybe that's the metaphor to use, break the circuit slightly of some of the jumps that political theorists tend to make from every, you know, in this idea that every good thing somehow goes together with every other good thing. Not very likely. Yes, please. Um, thank you so much, Teresa. So uh, I, I have a question on the on the lock front. I, I really appreciated the way in which you um, 
you know, both flag the fact that the exception lock makes for legitimate slavery in the case of uh, as as punishment um, for being a, the on the on the bad side of an unjust war. Um, I liked how you tr I, I really striking how you strike took that through that intuition, um, though it doesn't originate with Locke, through Rutherford, through Winston Lee. Um, and I was also struck, uh, though, by something else you said about Locke, which is, of course, you know, it, it may have been the case at the time he writes the second treatise that he wanted against fact to believe that the Africans being shipped to the mm -hmm. colonies had maybe been on the <laughs> losing side of an unjust war, which, um, you know, which indeed may be the case, and the point about indigenous peoples um, is well taken as well. But I guess I'm interested in another feature of Locke's view that I wonder if it gets taken up by some of your other thinkers too, mm -hmm. which is regardless of whether or not you could view the people being shipped against their will to the colonies as losers in an unjust war, Locke is absolutely unambiguous that the status of slave is not heritable. You cannot inherit it. And so that would pose a big problem for reading him as a apologist for the American mm -hmm. practice of chattel slavery, for example. And I just wonder whether that, um, that point about the non-inheritability of status when it comes to slavery is something that your other thinkers are also kind of pursuing the threads of. And I'd love to just hear a bit more about that. Yeah, it's so interesting. because I, I thought the question was going to go slightly elsewhere. Um, but just on that point first, I mean, that is implicit in the idea of slavery as a penal condition and that the, the son shall not be punished for the sins of the father. So in terms of sort of direct statements of that, I, I don't think so because um, I think that the idea of slavery as a kind of a, a herit inheritable status, I don't think, I think that's still kind of being worked out in practice in the Caribbean and that certainly hasn't fed back to the metropole, as far as I've seen in the kinds of, and again, I'm looking at very early discussions relative to England's participation in the global slave trade, um, but not early relative to the practice of slavery in Barbados and in the Caribbean. Um, but just on the sort of, sort of uh, the beginnings of the question, I mean, one thing I should, that was implicit in what I said, but I should have made explicit, is that one of the notable things about Locke is that Locke seems to be okay with the slave trade. There's nothing in Locke objecting to the kind of exchanging of money for, you're going to correct me, but this idea that, right, okay, so, right, we'll bracket, but I think that is sort of, you know, sort of uh, to, with, with uh, compliments to some of our colleagues, conspicuous by its absence, maybe, the sense that um, paying money or sort of trading in slaves is somehow not legitimate. I think, again, this might be a case where the invention of money means that a lot of things become permissible that previously hadn't been. Um, but secondly, uh, this is something um, that I'm writing a bit about, and I know that Mark Goldie is writing more about, which is that I think Locke's arguments about religious toleration and the idea that one's religious status or membership exists you know, separate from and independently of your political status or membership yeah, I don't think it's too far to sort of push that to say that part of what's going on there is this kind of increasing battle uh, in the colonies about missionaries evangelizing the African slaves. So the idea, Catherine Gerbner's argued this, that basically what happens in the latter decades of the 17th century, and Quakers are very involved in this, is that the conversion of so many enslaved people to Christianity is a really a problem because there's this sense that you know Christians can't be slaves. To become Christian is to is then to become free. And so partly the sort of toleration argument that says that, oh well, you know, it doesn't matter what religion you belong to, your civic status remains unaffected, enables this kind of transition from this sort of um, I think as Gerbner would say, the sort of the transition from the, the religion line to the color line with respect to slaves. So if the distinction is no longer between Christians and non-Christians, Christians and infidels, then the salience of race 
becomes you know, more and more pressing. So great, and I would just say that then Locke, too, on that issue is a much more disruptive mm. thinker than we tend to give him credit for, because yeah. when it comes to these later stages in his career, there may not be any intrinsic link between one's faith and one's politics, but um, it, is, it, it is important to him that in order to become uh, an Englishman, with all of the rights and protections of an Englishman, you have to be able to swear an oath of allegiance. And to swear mm. an oath of allegiance, you have to be a Christian. And, um, or at least that's his intuition. And part of his excitement about the possibility of getting indigenous people to convert is a, is a practical enthusiasm. Mm. Um, so I, I would just say that there he, he becomes, yeah, completely disruptive of some of what you're talking about. Well, so this is why I think the, um, you know, as political theorists, we read our half dozen great books and we want to say, OK, everything that we need to know about Locke is contained in the two treatises of government. But the sort of the unfortunate fact there is that Locke became a very important member of the Board of Trade after he published <laughs> the two treatises and all of the other things we tend to read. And so one of the things I'm interested to do in the Clarendon edition of the Letters on Toleration is just look at the kind of revision of the toleration arguments in the 1690s in light of what's going on with the evangelization of the native peoples of um, uh, New England, and then also these questions about um, slavery uh, in, you know, obviously I mean, people talk about slavery in Carolina, but that's quite early. It's very early in terms of Locke's trajectory. But again, you know, in terms of the sort of the minutia of the minutes of the Board of Trade, I'm just, I'm relying on Mark Goldie <laughs> to do that, and he swears he'll publish it eventually. Others. All right, I think this will be the last one. Monica. Thanks so much. This has been really fascinating. Um, in your discussion of Mary Astle, there were two elements of it that I found kind of surprising that I would love for you to expand a little bit upon. Um, because when you're talking about kind of her reception and how people have viewed her as a very radical thinker subsequently, um, and you made the case that that wasn't true and she was a Tory and she was actually quite conservative. She's a radical Tory. Radical Tory, fair. <laughs> but then this, you know, you put up this quote that in which she compares marriage, not just to a menial job, but actually to like a very demeaning menial job, almost like a feminist reclamation of Circe in some sense. Um, and so that to me felt, uh, it, it felt like it, it ought to be in conflict um, and particularly, as the second piece being uh, that you're making this point that um, her Tory arguments are, or sorry, her arguments being a Tory are pretty in line with what a lot of Tories say to Locke. Um, and I'm, I think I must be confused about this, but is the implication then that Tories are somehow more feminist or more pro-women than, um, than Whigs? Or can, can you parse that out for me? Uh, so, uh, is it an Annika? Annika? Annika. Let me introduce you to the, the great wide world of Tory feminism in the 17th century. <laughs> so, um, so no, it's not the case that it's only political conservatives who are making feminist arguments. That's not the case. You get, well, okay, you get women writers across the political spectrum, but it's, uh, it's, it's an observable and well-remarked upon phenomenon that a lot of women, for instance, Afra Ben, is also uh, uh, sort of a high Tory. So there is this sense, and it makes sense, Margaret Cavendish is the other one. It makes sense, though, when you think about it, because, I mean, monarchy, hereditary monarchy, so long as you don't have a Salic law, as in France, which disinherits female children, is a way of including women in politics. And so the idea, you know, the royalist idea of the great queen, Elizabeth I, uh, a real sense for Astell of the ascension of Queen Anne to the throne as the natural daughter of James II. I mean, when I say that she's a radical Tory, I mean, she's like a Jacobite, right? She does not, <laughs> she doesn't really, she doesn't at all approve of the, you know, inglorious revolution and that whole sort of like shenanigans that got pulled with William and Mary. But when Anne comes to the throne, she can be at peace again. Right, because this is someone who has rightly inherited the throne, and also she's a woman, and she, also she loves the Episcopal Church of England, 
and she sees it as an essential part of the English then British constitution. Um, and so again, just sort of, so, so that's, you know, as a historian of political thought, I'm interested in those arguments, the one that don't, don't necessarily fit what um, maybe political theorists expect. But also as a political theorist, I mean, I think that we, um, especially now when we're sort of thinking really hard about the syllabus and how it's constructed and who's included and who's excluded, I just think we need to be really careful that we don't just sort of assume that people in the history of political thought based on their you know, gender or race or whatever are going to say the things that we expect them to say. You know, it's, I think part of the problem with astral reception for a long time is because there was this kind of prefab box of what a feminist should look like. And so we just sort of read the bits of her that conformed to our expectations and then ignored all this really amazing other stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, in my first book, Roger Williams was kind of my, um, you know, uh, uh, my uh, redheaded stepchild of, the, of, of intellectual history that I wanted to revive and sort of bring into the, the canon. And Astle, I think, is really the hero of this book. I think that she needs to be much better integrated um, and taken much more seriously than perhaps she has been. Well, everyone, three lectures later, and she's still standing. So join me in, <laughs> join me in uh, thanking Teresa Big John.